Amen. Good morning. It looks like J.C. Penny had a sale on shirts this morning, looking out there, seeing some of you. My wife's never asked me to wear a specific shirt before. I should have known something was up with that. There was a teen, 15-year-old, who came to his mother wanting a car, and she said, okay, you're going to have to make sure that you keep your grades up. Number two, you're going to have to get a part-time job. And number three, you're going to have to get your hair cut. So he comes back a year later. He's got the grade card to prove it. He's got a, a wad of cash that he's saved for a down payment, but no haircut. And uh, the son says to his mother, well, mom, Jesus had long hair, okay? And mom said, yeah, and he walked everywhere he went, too. So... So anyway, we're going to talk about walking today, deeper walk. If you have a copy of God's Word, turn to the first epistle of John, not the gospel, but the epistle of 1 John. We said last week that 1 John is somewhat cyclical, and while for the most part we will go through this book verse by verse, today is an exception because John has themes and repeats himself intentionally and if we, don't, if we go through it verse by verse, what you're going to do is in two weeks, you're going to say, didn't he just preach on that two weeks ago? And then in about four or five weeks, you're going to think, didn't he just preach on that uh, four or five weeks ago? And the answer would be yes, because he repeats these themes. So today we're going to look at that in 1 John uh, chapter 1. Let's begin by reading verses 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. We'll be looking in chapter 2 and chapter 3 also during the message today. How do you know if someone is a real Christian? Is it the fish sticker on their bumper? Maybe it's a Bible on their desk at work. They don't use bad words or they go to church a lot. The problem is lots of people don't cuss and lots of people go to church. Jesus said people will know we are disciples by our love. He said that in the Gospel of John chapter 13, verse 35. But lots of people love. We could say that a real Christian is someone who has accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And while that sounds good, being a Christian is more than praying a prayer or raising your hand at invitation or even being baptized. I think this one must be it. They'll know we are Christians by what? By our t-shirt, right? They'll know we are Christians by our t-shirts. That must be it. Well, three out of four Americans describe themselves as Christians. So how do you know if someone really is? How do you know if you are? We're in this series in 1 John, learning each week what it means to go deeper in our faith. And last week we talked about deeper joy. Our joy can only be complete when we're fellowshipping with the Lord and fellowshipping with one another. We cannot go deeper apart from Christian community. And so John is writing some 50 years after Jesus has lived and died and left the earth and now his readers are two to three generations apart from the historical Jesus. And many of them are beginning to question their faith. Even some doubts are arising in the Christian community. They're not experiencing the fullness, the joy, maybe that they saw their parents or grandparents experience, or the joy that even John is talking about in his writing. So in his letter, John will propose three tests over the coming weeks that reveal whether or not a person is a Christian. There's the doctrinal test, what do you believe? The ethical test, how do you live? And the relational test, who do you love? And this is John's cyclical approach in the epistle. He says something about each one, then comes back later and takes a deeper dive about each one as he's drilling down. So today, he introduces the ethical test how do you live? And let's, so let's, this morning, let's follow John's reasoning, if you will, as he takes us deeper in our understanding of what it means to be a real Christian. And the first point is this, real Christians don't just believe their faith, 
They practice their faith. They do their faith. Let's look back to 1 John 1, verses 5 through 7. Parts of that, again, God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now, everybody probably has their own idea of what it means to go deeper. Maybe it's a deeper knowledge of the Bible. Meaty sermons, lots of Greek words and cross-references, verse by verse through the book of Leviticus, right? Or unlocking the mysteries of Revelation. Maybe it's deeper experiences with Christ or greater intimacy with God in nature. Maybe it's experiencing the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Maybe some during worship want chills to run up and down their spine. But John starts simply with this, stop sinning. Now that's probably not what you wanted to hear this morning. I can already see some of you when Jamie gets back, you go up to him and say, we are so glad you're back. That guy that filled in, all he talked about was sin while you were gone. John says, if you're a Christian, start living like one. Verse 5, God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. This would have been a statement that would have been familiar to Jewish readers. Light is used throughout Scripture to speak of the holiness of God. To the Greeks, it would have been a metaphor for higher truth and spiritual discovery. And there were some false teachers who were blending those two thoughts and offering people spiritual enlightenment and secret knowledge and mystical experiences. And eventually this teaching would become to know, be known as Gnosticism from the Greek word to know. And Gnosticism became a real problem in the early church, a real threat as believers went off in search of deeper truths, deeper experiences. And many came to believe that only spirituality mattered, that material things weren't important, only the spirit was eternal. So they didn't think it mattered what they did with their bodies, promiscuity, drunkenness, gluttony. And the implication is that those who walk in darkness may claim to believe the truth without doing the truth, but there can be no genuine believing without practicing or living the truth. Light and darkness are like oil and water. They're opposites of each other. God brought light into the world, Genesis 1-3 tells us. Then later Jesus would declare in John 8-12 that I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, our daily, experience, our daily lives, our daily experiences are to live up to the expectations that Jesus has for us. And let me tell you this, by His grace, His expe expectations for us are realistic. Now, I didn't say easy, but Jesus doesn't ask of us that which is not realistic. With His presence and with His power in our lives, He enables us to do that which He has called us and created us to be. Even though we stumble, He doesn't lower His standards. And the benefit of walking in the light is perfect fellowship with God and with one another. Walking means way of life. We're always to make progress in our Christian lives. Maybe two steps forward and one step back. I said if I ever write a book, I'm going to title it Two Steps Forward, One Step Back, but moving in the right direction. Maybe the story of our lives is two steps forward, one step back, but moving in His direction. That's a good theme, don't you think? There's hills and valleys, but we're making progress. To walk in the light is to live day by day in a close relationship to God. I've been reading through the Psalms this year, studying through the Psalms. I'm on Psalm 67. Psalm 67 was this morning. And when you study the Psalms like that, you see the themes that are over and over and out crying out to God, even doubting God, questioning God. But in most of the Psalms, by the end of the chapter, God has answered. God has heard. He's heard the doubts. He's heard the trials. He's heard the struggles. And He has answered. And by the end of the Psalm, the psalmist is no longer questioning God, but praising God and thanking God. 
When we walk in the light, our lives can be an open book. They don't have to contain secret sins or falsehoods or deceptions. It is Jesus' blood that cleanses us from our sin. More on that next week. The shedding of Jesus' blood and His crucifixion achieves the all-important removal of sin that enables believers to walk in the light. There was an article in Christianity Today a while back entitled, Hipster Christianity, What Happens When Cool Meets Christ. It is a movement of younger evangelicals who want to shed some of the trappings of the mainstream baby boomer Christianity, bumper stickers, mega churches, right-wing politics. They, the article says they want a more gritty, relevant, justice-oriented faith. They meet in nightclubs, they cuss in the pulpit, they cancel services to serve the poor. And there's something appealing about it. These hipster, church, hipster churches are exposing some of the shallowness and hypocrisy of their parents' generation who built bigger houses and bigger churches all the while, neglecting the poor, ignoring the environment, and turning the gospel into a commodity. But at the same time, there's something disturbing about it. This new breed of Christians seems to think that as long as they're doing social justice and unplugged authentic worship, things like drinking and swearing and sexual experimentation are no big deal. There's some similarities to the Gnostics in the first century. I think John would have problems with boomer Christianity and hipster faith both. We can't separate the spiritual from the material, belief from behavior, because living in the light is as much about sexual purity as it is social justice. It's about what we do with our bodies and our souls. So John is reminding us that light isn't just about knowledge, it's about conduct. God isn't light because He's spiritual, God is light because He is holy, and His people should be too if they want to go deeper. Look again at verse 6, chapter 1, if we claim to have fellowship with Him but walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth which can be translated, we do not do the truth. Now it sounds awkward to talk about doing truth, but that's exactly John's point. We think of truth as something we know. John tells us that truth is something that we do. If it's true that wearing seatbelts saves lives, it's not enough to know that truth. You have to do that truth. You have to buckle up. Texting can we all just put our phones down while we're driving anyway? You don't need to be on your phone to have a wreck on range line anyway, right? In 2020, cell phone use, listen to this, 1.6 million crashes in 2020 because distracted drivers were on their cell phones. We know what it can do, don't we? And yet... Does your belief affect your behavior? If it's true that every person is created in the image of God, then we'll treat every person with dignity and respect, regardless of race, religion, class, sexual orientation, political affiliation. If we believe that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, then we'll keep them healthy and pure so He can be at home in them. If it's true that everything we belong, that we have, belongs to God, we'll be good stewards of it and we'll possess it with an open hand and we'll give generously and spend wisely. According to John, real Christians don't just believe their faith, they practice their faith, they do their faith. Point number two, and it's going to be found in the second chapter. Real Christians don't talk the walk, they walk the talk. Look at how they live in 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6. Now, we're going to come back to these other verses that we're skipping next week. Chapter 2, verse 3, and we know, by this we know, that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in Him, 
Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now John's drilling down in 1 John 2. John uses the words know and truth, words that are associated with going deeper, and turns them into behaviors. If you want to know if someone's a real Christian, John says don't just ask them what they believe, look at how they live. In fact, John says, if someone claims to be a Christian, but they don't do what Christ says, they are a liar. Now remember, the Gnostics claimed that sin in a Christian's life did not matter, but but John makes the point that obedience is the mark of a true Christian. Keeping his commandments is not the way to be saved, but yet they give assurance of salvation because our hearts have been changed. This is another reason John is writing. We can have assurance of our salvation. This is a true test of how we know if we're in right relationship to God. Now, John is not voiding the Ten Commandments, but he's likely referring to the commandments of Jesus. John is saying it is inconsistent to say you are a Christian and not live by Christ commands. Well, what are Christ's commands? Well, we could look in the Gospels. We could look especially in the Gospel of John. But even the epistle of John in 1 John 3, 23 says, and this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. A failure to love is evidence one does not really know Jesus because knowing Jesus is is evidenced by love. Love for God is perfected. It's brought to its intended goal, if you will, by obedience. John is not reducing the faith to legalism here. He is not reducing the faith to a list of rules. You're not going to get a bulletin here that says on the back, 10 things you need to do in order to have assurance of salvation. Not at this church. Because we are Christians, because our hearts have been changed, We have a love for God. We have a love for His Word. Our attitudes, our desires have been changed. It is this Word that gives us perfected love and assurance of salvation. Our obedience does not bring justification. Never did, never can. But obedience is a pattern of life that gives evidence that one is born again. Now, I'm not much of an artist. If I could paint a picture, here's what I would paint. A picture of these two women who give testimony, my mother and my wife, that obedience is a pattern of life that gives evidence that one is born again. When I look at these two ladies, I don't just know that they've been saved. I see that they've been saved. I see in their life evidence that one is born again. And I'm thankful to God for both of them. Walking as Jesus walked means that we walk in love, following the lead of the one who loved us enough to die for us. If we are in Him, we can know Him, we can enjoy fellowship with Him, and we can walk in the light. There was a disturbing Barna poll that took place a few years ago. Now, everything you all understand in these weeks, I'm filling in for Jamie. When I say a few weeks ago, we're talking anywhere from yesterday to 20 years ago, right? A few years ago. A disturbing Barna poll compared the behavior of so-called born-again Christians with the rest of the population. And it was stunning. It was difficult to find a contrast. These were people who said that they had accepted Christ and believed that the Bible was the Word of God. The survey found that in a 30-day period, these self-identified Christians were nearly as likely as anyone else to gamble, to visit a pornographic website, to take something that didn't belong to them, to physically fight or abuse someone, to drink too much, to use an illegal drug, to have said something that wasn't true, to have gotten back at someone for something they did, and to have had said and to have said mean things about someone behind their back. 
John would have a problem with this. In 1 John 2, 6, John says, Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. John is saying that a person's walk should match their talk. This word walk in the original language was sometimes used to describe a person's daily living. What does that mean? How does a first 21st century Christian walk as Jesus walked? Well, you remember it's been, you know, a decade now, but you might still see some of them around, but the WWJD question mark bracelets were really big, right? What would Jesus do? We all probably had one or one wore one. What would Jesus do? But the better question to ask is what would Jesus do if he were you? If Jesus were a truck driver, what kind of truck driver would he be? Would he obey the rules of the road? Would he keep his rig in safe operating condition? Would he help other drivers who needed assistance? And most of all, would he toot his horn when the kids wanted him to toot his horn, right? If Jesus were in middle management, what kind of manager would he be? Would he talk about his boss behind his back? Would he make unreasonable demands on his people, do the bare minimum, pad his expense accounts? If Jesus were a parent, what kind of parent would he be? What kind of TV shows, what kind of games would they watch and play? How attentive to his kids' health and homework and friends? How often would he read with them and and pray with them? And would he really threaten to throw them out of the car if they didn't quit fighting in the back? (laughs) If Jesus were in high school, what kind of high schooler would he be? How would he treat kids, especially the left out kids, the marginal kids? How hard would he study and apply himself? How hard would he practice? Which parties would he go to? Which parties would he skip? Which conversations would he walk away from? Think through your daily life. How would Jesus live it if he were you? Being a Christian isn't just a matter of believing what Jesus said. It is a matter of living what Jesus lived. Knowing and doing go together. You can't know how Jesus would live your life if you don't know how he lived his life. So you study the scripture and you spend time in prayer But if that study and prayer never makes a difference in your life, you haven't gone deeper at all. This passage gives us some diagnostics, if you will, about whether we're in Christ or not. If you keep Jesus' commands, if you keep His Word, if you walk in love, then you can have assurance that you know Him and are in Him. Real Christians... Don't just talk the walk. They walk the talk. Look at how they live. And then a third point, and it's found in 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. Real Christians don't just know more about Christ. They're becoming more like Christ. Look in 1 John 3, verses 7 through 10. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he is been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. John is keeping it simple. Either you're in the light or you're not. You're in the light or you're in the dark. You're living the truth or you're living a lie. You're either a child of God or a child of the devil. John appeals to his readers, don't be deceived by false teachers. If you have received the righteousness of Christ through salvation, His righteousness will produce in you righteous character that will produce righteous conduct. 
Don't be fooled. If your life has not changed, you have not encountered the Jesus of the Bible. John isn't saying that a real Christian never sins. He just says he cannot go on sinning as if before. He's talking about habitual behavior, not occasional lapses, yet he expects progress. The person who habitually commits sin is of the devil, John says. He is lost. Sin has always been characteristic of the devil. The purpose of Christ's entrance into the world was to destroy the works of the devil. And Satan's first defeat was, defeat was in the wilderness. His greatest defeat was at the cross. And his ultimate defeat is when Jesus confines him to the eternal lake of fire. Glory be to God. That's good news. We're not going to fight old Slewfoot forever. No one born of God commits sin, practices sin, because God's nature, God's seed abides in him. Born of God, divine action, something supernatural about the life of the Christian, for he has been regenerated by the power of God. Now, how do we distinguish? Well, the answer is in verse 10. Their lifestyles and their attitudes are different. The contrast is obvious. The devil's children do not practice righteousness and they do not love others. The Christian's attitude towards sin is different because we understand sin's cost. The cross of Calvary. Now, Christian traditions differ on how they handle this question. Some in the holiness tradition stress the demands of righteousness and talk about sanctification as if it's more uh, a work that is placed upon the believer. Some in the Reformed traditions emphasize more that it's totally uh, a work of God's grace and love. It's kind of out of our hands. Baptists believe that true Christians persevere to the end and that we are kept by the power of God. But sadly, there are many in the Christian community for whom habitual sin is of no real consequence to them. Even among pastors, a hesitancy to speak about purity and righteous living. I'm not much of an artist. My wife is the artist, and I sketched out some things. I think this came from Bruce Wilkerson, and I tried to find it and Bruce has been gone now with the Lord for quite a while, and I thought I could Google it and find it, and I couldn't. I kind of sketched it out, and Austin, I don't think he appreciated the artistic uh, creativity, uh, and so he uh, redid the diagram for me, and I'm thankful that Austin did that because now you'll be able to read it and understand it. But our audio-visual team, by the way, does a great job here at First Baptist Joplin, don't you think? Let's give them a hand. They really do. Because I threw some things at, at Austin and, and even late this week. And he helped me with this diagram. Let's look at diagram one. This is a horizontal axis is a person's faith, the doctrinal axis. On the left is someone who doesn't know God, know God. And on the right is someone who knows God. Now the second diagram, you add the vertical axis on the sides. And you see at the top, we have the ethical axis. And then in diagram three at the bottom, the non-believer at some point moves from no God to knowing God in his life. And as the person grows in his or her knowledge of God, changed behavior moves up the axis. A person grows in their knowledge of God and as a result becomes more like Christ in his or her conduct. A true Christian, a growing Christian should be moving upward in the right quadrant. It may not be a straight line. It may be a wavy line, but it's moving in the right direction. You see, the true barometer of what people really believe, whatever they say they believe, is behavior, and that is the ethical dimension, which is John, what John's dealing with today. Knowing God through conversion and spiritual growth results in ethical behavior. Children bear the family resemblance. We have a little grandson, he's three, turning four, Jonas. I call him Aaron Jr. Our son's name is Aaron. 
because he's just like his daddy was when his daddy was that age, just like him. And he reminds me a lot of the Decker lineage. And so I'll call him all kinds of things. He doesn't like that when I, when I do that. But children bear the family resemblance. Now, only God and you know where you are on this quadrant. You don't capture the mystery of salvation in a diagram. Only God knows when you cross that barrier of not knowing God to knowing God. This, this diagram, it's like a test. It's an illustration to help you to evaluate yourself, not others. John didn't write this letter so that his readers would point fingers and pass judgment on other people. He wrote it so that they would know whether or not they were really Christian and how they could experience a deeper walk with Christ. And that's John's big idea of the deeper walk. And here's the bottom line this morning, and I'll leave us with this. You know you're going deeper when your belief and your behavior are taking you closer to Jesus. You know. You will know. You will have assurance. That you're living deep when your belief and behavior come together and take you closer to Jesus. Would you bow with me this morning, please? Where are you this morning? Do you know God? Have you crossed the line of faith? Have you moved from darkness to light, from falsehood to truth, from being a child of the, Satan to a child of God? If not, today is the day to believe in Him and receive Him as Lord and Savior. Christian, maybe it's a wavy path, but are you becoming more like Christ every day? That hope of heaven, are you moving closer to Him in belief? and behavior. This time of invitation is a time for you to come and kneel and pray. The time for you to make a decision public that God is doing in your heart. Lord, we give you this time to be glorified in it. Draw all people to yourself. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings.